Good morning. I'm Reverend Kathy McCall, and I'm the minister at Unity North Spiritual Center in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. Wherever you are this morning, I welcome you to our Sunday lesson, and I'm so glad you can be with us. Consider yourself virtually hugged. We give a lot of hugs in Unity, and we just have to do them virtually now. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, our website is unitynorthmn.org, and this lesson will be available on that site tomorrow. So tell your friends. And also, if you would like to make a donation to our ministry at this important time, you can go to that website, and on the homepage, there is a donate button. So we appreciate your, your support. And I'll begin today with a, a brief meditation followed by uh, the Sunday lesson. So just close your eyes, take a deep breath. Say to yourself, I am completely relaxed as you feel that relaxation moving down through your body. Allow me to speak the words for you. <clears throat> it is not I, but the Christ within who does the work. I am now in the presence of pure divine love. And I know I'm one with the beating heart of the universe. And that divine love blesses me in all that I do. If I have a concern, I know that throughout the day I can say, God's love is greater than this. So if my concern is about my health and wholeness, God's love is greater than my worries about that. Or if it's about my prosperity and abundance, God's love is greater than my fears, greater than any belief in lack. Whatever it's about, I can say God's love is greater than this and turn it over to divine love I know that divine love is greater than any of the difficulties in the whole world. So when I see the, the news and feel alarmed, I say to myself, God's love is greater than any difficulties in the world. And I know that truth, that God is in charge So I relax, I let go, and let God's perfect good come forth. And I give thanks for this day, and know that one day at a time, I keep my thoughts positive, and I step forward in faith. I say thank you, thank you God, and so it is, amen. <clears throat> Well, today is the beginning of Holy Week, and so the lesson is Holy Week into Compassion. Some children were asked the question, what does love mean? And Chrissy, age six, said, love is when you go out to eat and you give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. Terry, age four, said, love is what makes you smile when you're tired. And Four-year-old Billy said, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. Marianne, age four, said, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. Well, we may have some different definitions of love, and the same is true of compassion. Theologian Matthew Fox says, 
Compassion is our response to our interconnectivity. Buddhist Jack Cornfield says, compassion is the quivering of the pure heart that occurs when we allow ourselves to be touched by the pain of life. Let yourself feel how the beauty of every being brings you joy and how the suffering of any being brings, or makes you weep. Most of us can feel that, feel that at this time in our lives and in our world. Compassion is about sharing our common joy and beauty as well as sharing our common pain and suffering. So we have the capacity to proclaim the power of a tender, loving heart in the face of all the suffering of the world. And never has there been a time like this for all of us to absolutely know our oneness through a worldwide shared experience. Whenever our heart is open and uncovered, the awakening of this stream of compassion begins within. And this spirit of love cannot help but transform ourselves and others. The awakening of our compassion is reflected in Holy Week. The stages of Jesus' life help show us our own journey into compassion. And the last week of the life of Jesus is remembered today on Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. And during that last week, Jesus went to Jerusalem at the time of Passover to make a final appeal to the Jewish people to transform themselves and prepare the kingdom. John 12 speaks of Palm Sunday. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. A great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. He is victorious and humble, riding on a donkey. So Jesus did not come as the warrior Messiah the people had been expecting, but as was prophesied, one humble, a lover of children and animals, and one with an open heart. In our more contemporary world, it was Palm Sunday, but because of a sore throat, five-year-old Johnny stayed home from church with a sitter. When the family returned home, they were carrying several palm fronds, and Johnny asked them what they were for. People held them over Jesus' head as he walked by, his father told him. Wouldn't you know it, Johnny fumed, the one Sunday I don't go and he shows up. Well, Holy Week is like a condensed version of the life of Jesus into a very short time of great intensity. Each event symbolizes an aspect of the awakening of our heart to deeper compassion. So the first stage of Holy Week is the celebration of Palm Sunday as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Charles Fillmore, co-founder of Unity, said that Jerusalem, the city of David, symbolizes the love center in human consciousness, located within the heart chakra. And this is the habitation of peace and love. So Palm Sunday represents the place in each person's journey of awakening in which we enter into and open the heart to compassion. Certainly we can all use a little more compassion and that's certainly one of the great messages to all of humankind right now. We can ask ourselves, have I had a single thought of self-condemnation this week? Have I beat myself up for any single thing? And if the answer is yes, we can use some self-compassion. We can also ask ourselves, have I condemned another this week? And if so, I can use some compassion. Have I begun to become numb to the number of deaths and the suffering taking place now? I can pause and open my heart 
and feel my feelings, feel my compassion. Palm Sunday is the place in our journey where we wake up to compassion. Going into Jerusalem was a risk because many people wanted to kill Jesus since he had become a danger to the religious institutions of his day. <coughs> and it can feel to us like it's a risk to enter into and open the heart. It becomes a danger to any of the false belief systems we've created. It means we might have to give up anger, resentment, negativity, and fear in order to overcome the final struggle of the ego to keep us feeling separate. Now we must move into our heart center and hold firm to compassionate love. So in the second stage of Holy Week, Jesus immediately threw the money changers out of the temple. He overturned their tables and he loudly proclaimed, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. But once we enter into our hearts to fully awaken compassion, it's necessary for us to cast out negative thinking, old habits, false beliefs, all that which corrupts the temple of our heart. What is an example of a money changer experience at this time, do you think? Well, perhaps if we see a group of people selfishly ignoring the need for social distancing, we might need to speak out. The media did, for example, in regard to all those people having a great holiday on a Florida beach when others were simultaneously dying because of the virus being spread through such social contact. contact. Or perhaps money changers are those who would profit from people's or misery by price gouging. Or those who are greedy when this is a time that calls for generosity. We must each cast the money changers from the temple of our own hearts. Those false beliefs or resentments, those selfish behaviors, those condemning thoughts we might hold toward any other being. Like Jesus, we must stand up for truth and cast the money changers out of our lives. Let us open the door of our hearts to inner and outer compassion. So the fourth stage of Holy Week is ministry. After Jesus threw out the money changers, he did more ministering on Monday and Tuesday of that last week. And as a matter of fact, nearly one half of all of his recorded sayings were delivered in those two days. When we cast away old habits, we are then teachable. We can be taught and we also have the capacity to teach and serve others with compassion. There was a man who went searching for the meaning of life. And after several years and many miles, he reached the hut of a holy hermit and asked for enlightenment. Well, the holy hermit invited him in and poured him a cup of tea. And as he poured, he kept pouring until the cup was overflowing and our tea started to drip onto the floor. Till finally the man couldn't stand it any longer. And he said, wait, stop. It, it's, it's, oh, it's filled, no more will go in. Well, like this cup, said the hermit, you're full of your own opinions, preconceptions and ideas. How can I teach you unless you first empty your cup? So after we cast out the money changers, when we empty our cup and cast out whatever is blocking our good, we become teachable. Then we have something to teach and we can minister to others with compassion. The Dalai Lama said, compassion is not pity toward another. Rather, it denotes a feeling of connection with others, reflecting its origins in empathy. It leads not to emoting, but to taking action, to service, to getting involved in relieving the burdens of another suffering, a giving of our time and talents to assisting others. This in turn brings happiness to ourselves. 
Well, I grew up in Salt Lake City, and my mother was my spiritual teacher. And she was always finding people to help. Sometimes to my father's consternation, because she would actually bring them home and feed them and give them money. So it was, it was her 12-step work, and she was a hands-on kind of person. Sometimes she would literally adopt people and find, well, not literally, but she would adopt people and, and find housing for them, and then she would keep check on their lives. And I got so, I would be tuned in to people who were in need and I would call my mother on the phone and say, Mom, can you come and help with this person? And she always would, if it was appropriate, of course, at the time. So once I had this mystical experience, I was in a huge event filled with people. And all of a sudden, I became tuned in to all of the suffering with the people in this event arena. And then suddenly, I became tuned into all of their joy. It was like being tuned into all of the suffering and then all of the joy of the world. And it was just an amazing experience. But after that, I understood my mother better. I, I was overwhelmed with such compassion. I just understood her better and her level of compassion. But... I didn't start bringing people home to feed them. I went into the ministry and served in another kind of arena. See, each one of us loves differently. Compassion may be felt and then often involves specific action. Well, the next important stage or experience of Holy Week was the fifth step, the upper room. And this is where the Passover Supper, known as the Last Supper of Jesus, was held. And this is symbolic of entering into a high state of consciousness where we cast away or release the negative and false. And then we go to the upper room, that high place within. So some of Jesus' greatest teachings were given in the upper room during his Last Supper. And this is the place where we go within. And we are taught by the living spirit of truth. And one of the most significant passages delivered at that meal is John 13, 34. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So the former commandments were given by Moses, the lawbringer, they were strong directives about what the people of the time should and should not do. But Jesus brought a new commandment, one declaring love and compassion. You know, my father had this older sister. Her name was Dorothy. And she was my Aunt Dorothy. She was a school teacher, and then she became a an elementary school principal. And she was one of my primary caregivers besides my parents because she was an integral part of our family, having had no children and having never married. And, but she and my mother had a rivalry that went on. Dorothy would get jealous of, some time, of, of my mom sometimes and vice versa. But they... Um, they had this rivalry that brought, you know, really strong bitterness to be overcome. And it was really a love-hate relationship in many ways. So in my last visit with my mother when she was dying, she said to me, for Dorothy, I only feel compassion. And it was so interesting also, because for the last 12 years of Dorothy's life, she was confined to a wheelchair because of a stroke. And in the last two years of their lives, my mother lived in a retirement inn several blocks away, and they did not see each other for those two years. 
but my mother always felt that Dorothy was in a contest to live longer. Though she was about eight years older, in her 90s. So when my mom died, I said to my brother and sister, I'll give Dorothy six more months. And she actually died four months later. My mother was right. Well, it's not always easy to have compassion with some of those people with whom we have, I would call, deep karmic issues. But my mother did, she succeeded at the end. She was always teaching me about compassion, even right up to the end. So the sixth stage was betrayal and crucifixion. And this was the betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane leading to crucifixion or the dark night of the soul. You know, in the Garden at night, his disciples first went to sleep and then Jesus was alone. And he had to overcome his fear. And that's what happens to us in the dark night. We must find our way alone until we can fully surrender to God and say, Thy will be done. Often betrayal is part of this spiritual path. For this entire journey is about the death and the transformation of the ego, that fearful part of us that keeps us believing we are separate from God. It is the source of our negativity and our false belief. You know, this current time in which we are all isolated is such a Garden of Gethsemane experience. We may feel betrayed, too, by our world, by our government, or certain individuals. We may feel fearful at times in our aloneness. Even the fear of death may haunt us. This is a crucifixion experience for us personally and collectively right now. Our fears must be crucified, crossed out, and reintegrated so the new spiritual consciousness of compassionate love can be born. And that takes us to the final stage of resurrection and ascension. To recap, we enter Jerusalem, the heart center. We cast out the money changers, the negative fears of the ego. We become teachable. We take time in the upper room, that inner dwelling place within, and we nourish ourselves by listening to the spirit of truth. We remember the new commandment that we love one another, even as, a, as we are loved by the Christ, by God, by the universe. And we recognize the self-betrayal of the ego. And we cast it away, we cross it out, we crucify it, letting go of our fears. And finally, we are resurrected. Do you want to know more about how we are resurrected and transformed? Well, then I recommend you listen to the Easter service next week. You know, we were hoping all of this could be over in time for an actual Easter service, but sometimes the dark night of the soul, our crucifixion takes longer. I will be recording both a Good Friday and an Easter Lenten service this coming week. So check on both Friday and Sunday. Actually, resurrection is our new beginning. The darkness lifts and the dawn comes. We have integrated love more deeply into our being through a more compassionate heart, which recognizes the sacred in all of life. We ascend or transcend the old ways of the past, and we are born anew. And that is a vision for all of us to hold. Jesus came to challenge existing paradigms to bring a greater awareness to our relationship with God and a greater experience of the presence of God. And people responded to his message with a hope for redemption that he represented. As a result, sometimes we wait for a savior to rescue us in our own lives, in our church, in our country, in our world. But the vision Jesus brought is one of transforming consciousness. Then the outer circumstances follow. Jesus offered the bliss of connection to the one 
to be followed by peace on earth, heaven on earth, love on earth. Each of us has our part to play in taking our journey through the mystical stages of awakening. And we are already one with God, one with all good. We have only to know it and experience it. And doing that together makes all the difference. So as we begin to personally and collectively shift, we will no longer feel the outer threat to our lives and well-being that all of us are experiencing at this time. I invite you this Holy Week to open your heart, experience divine compassion, and through a simple act of loving kindness, make a difference in the world. Have a blessed Holy Week. God bless you.